Ah, shit. I'm a ding dong daddy from Dumas, and yeah. you really ought to see my stuff. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> It's one fucking hour time. I am Evan Husney. Of course, this is the show where we talk about one movie for one fucking hour. And uh, this is going to be a special one because we're looking at maybe something that isn't a movie, technically. It is uh, television, <laughs> feature length television. But uh, for the purposes of you know the show, we're going to be looking at this and considering it as a standalone sort of 90-minute doc. Anyway... Let's introduce the people who we got here on the show. We got to my left. We got Tom Fitzgerald in the house. Tom, what's going on? Hello. <laughs> All right. And we got... Um, <laughs> and we also keep it got, awkward, right? Yeah, right. It's perfect. On brand for, for this, this episode. episode. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, and uh, to my right, we got Mr. Marcus Herring. What's going on, Marcus? What's up? I'm also not going to be able to give you much more than that, so let's just do the episode. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, we're coming hot off the heels of Tom's birthday uh, spectacular episode. Uh, shout out to that. That was a lot of fun. One fucking hour on BJ Lang Presents. It really was. Yeah. I already miss it. Like, <laughs> isn't there isn't there any Mickey Rooney in this? Not even like two like percent traces of Mickey Rooney. Oh Darn it. my god, that um, was the most indulgent hour of the show yes, we've ever it done. It, it was, was like a, but, like a like a, the Roman Empire version of our show. You know? <laughs> yes, like we're being fed grapes, and you know, <laughs> this you know this this reminds me, guys. I didn't talk about this off air, but uh, I got a lot in the producer for that film. And uh, I, I, uh, I've been looking in the, the hunt to see if there's any 35 of BJ Lang has begun. Right, oh, so just, just throw that out there. I, I actually have some news. Um, there's oh. parties. Uh, yeah, uh, whatever. Why not? We'll follow up. Uh, there's parties who um, I'm friends with who have sourced a print of BJ Lang Presents. Oh. But uh, as far as a release, you know, restoration release, it's tied up with rights. That's all I'll say. So okay. don't expect it. You know, there's a bidding at, war um, right now for yeah, BJ right, Lang. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. it, so don't expect to, to see it at Circuit City anytime soon. Circuit um, City. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, but there is a print. There's a print that's in the it's in the the network of um, collector geek psychos. So it, wow. it's there. It's just what to do with it now. So that's the question. It's, it's very wow. tragic, but there's an issue and or two and. All right. So we have found a print uh, in the world. All right. Wow. Well, yeah, we that was a lot it. of fun. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Check out the episode in the archive if you haven't. That was Tom's birthday spectacular. He picked uh, one of the craziest, weirdest, wildest, most singular films I've ever seen. Um, and we went to town on it. So uh, we did that. Um, but after we recorded the episode, real quick, <clears throat> if we could just have a little pre-show banter. And then, of course, we'll get to Finding Francis here in a second. But right after we recorded the episode, we were hanging out and talking sort of about that phenomenon that everybody has. Everybody has a story of when they were a kid or, you know, they, they saw something on television, they saw a movie, a TV show, something that made an indelible impression, usually scared the fuck out of them or something and that's stuck in your mind, but you don't know what it's from. There was no internet. There was no cell phones. So that, that image has haunted you for decades and you're trying to figure out what Not, it is. Yeah. Not even like a film, but just like, you know, the way media was consumed, like you're flipping channels and you're haunted by 22 seconds of something yeah. right. that's in some media format and it just went by you. But and you yeah. have nothing to anchor yourself. There's no, you know, famous this or that. And you're just lost in the sauce, even in this era of, you know, everything at your fingertips. It's like mm -hmm. um, so, so we talked about that. We all have them. Uh, in our yeah. group so yeah you call them childhood haunts things that you know you, you, you know, like i was saying usually you're you know horror just made it or something that made a huge impression scared you whatever whatnot so anyway i was telling you guys mine the one that i have and it's kind of re-kickstarted this mystery to try and solve so i'm going to use the platform gentlemen indulge me i'm going to use the platform of our fine program the tens of thousands of listeners we have who are out there of course <laughs> Uh, to help me figure out 
this mystery of something that I saw when I was a kid on television. Okay, so here it is. Now it shouldn't be that hard because it involves Jack Nicholson. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. Right. You'd think like, You'd like think. a huge iconic movie star is is, yeah. is one of your haunts. Yeah. Yes, so one of my haunts. So, all right. So this is in the mid '90s. I've pinpointed it to probably around between '94 and '97. I think is when this took place. Um, and now it's not just my own singular memory. My brother was also there and shared this memory with me. And so he, to this nice. day, we share the same identical memory over seeing this, but we can't figure out what the fuck it is. Anyway, here's the I love scene. You're I'm hyping this up. <laughs> like it's this, like, let's like, wow, who could forget seeing that image? But you're about to explain what, what it is. It's like, yeah. It's yeah. That you're Here haunted by. Yeah, exactly. So, um, for anyone out there listening to this, please get in touch with us if this is familiar to you by any stretch. Immediately. Comment, whatever. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Let's figure it out. All right. So it's in the mid-90s. We're watching television, my brother and I. Now it's a scene, and there's Jack. Jack is there. And I, I want to say the movie feels like a rom-com or like a comedy or you know a dramedy of some kind. Um, and he doesn't appear to be older, so this is not like as good as it gets um, age. He okay. seems like 80s, I would say more 80s era Jack. So he, he's in a kitchen, and there's a center island in the kitchen. And I just talked to my brother the other day, and he remembered this exactly the same way. And there was an empty pizza box. Not Sorry, not, it wasn't empty. There was a pizza box sitting on the kitchen island. And he walks up to the pizza box. And there's also a female actress, can't remember who it was, who was the opposite of him, playing opposite him. She's there. He goes into the pizza box and he picks up he picks up a slice of pizza, right? And kind of in like a cool, sort of flirtatious, cute, you know, Jack being Jack. He takes this right. he takes the slice of pizza and kind of waltzes over to the female actress and in sort of like a sing songy way, he just goes, You want a piece of pizza? <laughs> you know, and so God. That's, and that's it. terrified you. No, yeah. I just don't know what it's I'm from. Kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. Uh, but, wow. So, so now, we, so we saw that, yeah. and I, immediately it was like we were, you know, making fun of it. We were doing impressions of it for right. years. We would always sing "Do you want a piece of pizza?" to each other for, like all the time. It's you know like this thing. So yeah. you know, Jack's one of the most impersonated people ever. So it was like this thing. So anyway, I don't know what it's from. I've looked. I'm just going to I'll kick it off to you guys. I've looked everywhere. I've watched all the movies from the era. Actually, about wow. two years ago, Ramey showed me Heartburn. She's like, are you sure it's not Heartburn? The Mike Nichols right. movie. And we're sitting there watching this movie and they're eating food in bed. You know, him and Meryl Streep are eating like we're eating spaghetti pizza, and, right? Yeah. And then there's a fucking scene where he picks up a slice of pizza and I literally was going to fall out of my chair. I'm like, here it is. Here it fucking <laughs> yeah. is. Here it is. And then, roll, please. Three, no. two, one. <laughs> like, no, you'd never think because happened. Heartburn, mid 80s kitchen. Yeah. Yes. Uh, pizza, pizza, uh, <laughs> opposite an actress. Uh, and, and like Marcus, when you told us, Marcus showed us a still from a Google search. And he's like holding this piece of pizza. He's and I'm holding like, pizza like that. Yeah. So it's like what? Like presenting it like I wanna be there. So it's like, what? I think you I think you guys misremembered it and it's like a Mandela effect thing. But we both and it's gotta just be heartburn. I no no, because we it made a big impression. We knew it was Jack. And honestly, like it's it's so weird. It's so weird to describe. We're both certain of it. And uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, I sort of well, thought so recently not, like not, Good. It's not Christian Slater uh, with the piece of pizza or something. You know, someone who no. sounds like Jack. Yeah, no, because we knew Marcus had. it was. He said that. Yeah, you said that when I was explaining this. No, uh, we're. I, I've confirmed with my brother. We're positive it's Jack. He's six years older than me too, so I was probably nine, oh, ten. Wow. He's okay. older, so he knew it was Jack. Mm. And then also, right. um, yeah. So it, it's it's just this thing that's puzzled us. You know, forever. I thought maybe was it like a European version of the movie, an extended cut, a deleted scene. Yeah, uh, right. maybe D bonus bonus. It features. feels very deleted scene. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like they tri like the features trimmed, and that's why we now are looking at heartburn. And it's not coming up, but it's like, or or it's a TV version. You know, and like right. there's all this like like maybe there's some gnarly stuff in in heartburn. I don't remember. Yeah. 
like, and then they had to switch it out and go, well, instead of him saying like, like, I, like I've never had an orgasm or whatever, you know, for yeah, like TBS. Yeah, that's what I thought, right? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I love that. And, then, and then they put it like, well, let's just like, hey, hey Harry, let's, Could be. Like, no more sex talk. Let's just have him talk about some pizza. And he's like, oh, yeah. it's on TBS. And you guys just say, <laughs> yeah. That's a All right. So that's good. <clears throat> good could theories. Be, could be Jack TV, Jack TV appearance too. Was he like on SNL or something in that era? You know, I mean. I mean, it's possible it was. It's kitchen though. It really felt like a movie. It, it felt like a movie. Right. You know, and like that we were watching like know. a movie and the scene just happened. Well, anyway, <laughs> if anyone out there can help out Evan I and his this. mission to, uh, I know. to um, is there's childhood haunts yeah. and then there's this. Yes. In that um, it's like an itch, it's the itch you can't scratch. It's exactly. Like, you know, Thank you. I, I didn't know for years that one of my haunts was Brain of Blood by Al Adamson. It took me like 20 years, you know, wow. so uh, it yeah. feels great. When you, when you sort it, sort I know. Your, uh, I I, I so, want it because I, I I need I want it as a sample on the show too, you know. So right. um, help us. And if Jack Nicholson's this watching, um, maybe he can. <laughs> stuff, you know. Yeah. So anyway, all right. My, we should start. Go ahead. What were you gonna say? Oh no, I was gonna say my, mine was waking up at like three in the morning when I was a kid with the TV on, and it was dogs like walking around at a bar like acting like people you know it, was, it seemed like a dream That's now a i know one. it was those those dogville comedies but it is sort of I, like an, it is an oh. ultimate one to to wake up to in the middle of the night so yeah it's like a uh, 1920s 30s dogville wow. dog versions of popular yeah, it's very like MTV our gang movies. type of yeah. shit yeah it's <laughs> amazing yeah, that's amazing go. all right well I, um yeah i the, the call is out the call is out, everybody. Uh, this is an emergency. So if you if this rings any sort of bells or you have any leads, comment, get in touch with us. We want to figure this out. So anyway, all right, let's talk about. Um, let, let's get into the episode for crying out loud. Episode fifty seven of the show, guys. We are doing one fucking hour on Nathan Fielder's Finding Francis. All right, so you guys ready to start that clock? Let's do it. Okay, here we go. Boom. <laughs> All right, a uh, little bit of background on the flick for the people at home. As I mentioned, it was, this is a TV program, but we're treating it like a doc. So here we go. Um, well, that's, well, just, I think the running time, there's a justification. Just, yes. just say that. We were yeah. discussing that. Like, it, it's yeah. about 90 minutes. So right. the shape of it, in that sense, is, is, is a film. You know, it's not 22 minutes. You know. Exactly. So stepping a little outside of our comfort zone, but still all the same at the same time. So here we go. Finding Francis is the 2017 feature-length finale episode of Nathan For You, uh, which, of course, is a parody. I guess the best way I can explain it is sort of a parody of a business improvement reality show, uh, which originally aired on Comedy Central from comedian Nathan Fielder. But this anomalous episode breaks the show's format and sees Nathan helping an eccentric man... Uh, uh, who once posed as a Bill Gates impersonator on an earlier episode of the show, and he helps him track down and reunite with a long-lost love from over 50 years ago. The two of them travel cross-country where Nathan stages one absurdist scheme after the other in order to help uncover clues and hidden truths, all of which builds to a surprisingly poignant exploration of human connection, loss, and regret. So... Um, we were talking before we hit record here, Tom, just on just, you know, I think it's good to contextualize not only just Nathan in terms of, you know, where he sits in, you know, culture, but also just, you know, reality TV in general, you know, this sort of phenomenon of reality TV and, you know, how um, someone like Nathan getting a hold of this kind of warped format and doing something pretty creative with right. it is pretty cool. I, right? I just feel like in a, in a way... If Nathan Fielder didn't happen, uh, it didn't do this. It would be necessary to invent him. I'm saying this poorly, but like I think it's inevitable that 20 years into uh, this new format of entertainment, the reality television show, starting you know with uh, you know American Idol and Survivor, like that it would. I wouldn't say it's like uh, flourished and evolved so much as mutated, because um, creative, interesting minds like Nathan Fielder's like uh, plays with those the tropes and and again this whole new format and uh, kind of goes under the hood with it and um, and it's as, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's as interesting as maybe any other art form like you know or any other kind of genre let's put it more specifically like you know like people mutated the western 
you know, in the 60s, you know what I mean? And I think that he's doing that now, you know, where he's 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 taking a new look at like um, a very firmly established part of modern pop culture, you know, and, and that's interesting because it's a reflection of something that um, didn't exist 20 odd years ago. And now it's ubiquitous, you know, so I, I love that there's a perversion of it from from this guy. Yeah, and I, I think there are building blocks or, you know, there's sort of an evolution of that where, I mean, you have someone like, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen who is sort of doing that yeah. too, you know, with yeah. with with Borat to a certain extent, Ali G and all that stuff. Um, yeah. But but there's something about reality TV and even the shittiest and craziest, you know, um, bottom of the barrel reality TV, there is... There is Milf Island? Yeah, right. Like shit like that, you know, like there is some bizarre humanity and grotesquerie to glean yeah. from a Snooky or from, you know, something like we can, you know, or yeah. like Dr. Pill Popper or no, Dr. Pimple Popper. Pimple Popper. Like, no. What is that? Like, holy <laughs> shit, that's a show. Sorry. Yes. My mom loves that show, by the way. Uh, there, you but, yeah. there you go. Well, shout out, mom. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, but I, I think, um, I, I don't know. I just I just think it's fascinating. And, and you know, with Nathan, you know, somebody who uh, sort of started, you know, he, he's kind of has an interesting background. He's a, you know, he's from Canada. He sort of grew up, you know, um, kind of being like a shy kid. And then he went on to do these like, or he basically became a child magician. And with that, I can relate because yeah. I was a child magician, too. I don't know if you all know <laughs> oh, that. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Keeping it under your I did uh, not know that. up your sleeve. Really? Did not know yeah. that. We're gonna have to talk further. I'm gonna put a pin in that. Boop. Boop. <laughs> well, there is. I mean, perhaps I can scare up some footage. Uh, I, I I did make one public uh, public access TV appearance as a magician as a kid awesome. at one point. Whoa, yeah. awesome. that does exist. Um, we'll see if I cut to it or not right here. Um, but yeah, uh, and and of course, you know, he 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 would go on to be, you know, uh, Canada. I can't remember the name of it, uh, but Canada sort of has their own version yeah. of the Daily Show, and he had these segments that were on there where he was doing these kind of man on the street, awkward interview sort of things. Yeah, and that's what sort of on helped your him. side, on your on your side. That's right, Nathan. Well, that was the name side. of his segment. Yeah, right. right. But I right. I think you're bringing up a point which I, I think is really cool about him is like. Uh, you could see, you could kind of track his development. If you've been aware of him for the past few years, you could kind of track how his development as an, as a as a host, as a comedian. And he's so open. It's not like you have to go back to find like the. There's been some unreleased footage of his mad, you know, whatever. Like on his like YouTube page, it has all these old videos from like 14, 15 years ago or whatever. Mm. With him like experimenting, you know, there's the one with like he's got like a really thin piece of watermelon. It's like flapping in the wind on set, you know, or like uh, his like hip hop band. I think it is side of smooth with that one song. It's like zip, zap, zip, 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 you know, whatever. You can kind of see his development and you see him get started on on the Canadian version of, you know, on your side or whatever. And you see how now he gets more and more confident and he shifts his character a little bit downplays the awkwardness and i find it to be really interesting to kind of track his development as a as a comedian and then you know all the way through most of uh, uh of uh nathan for you uh but then just completely bust out with the rehearsal with something that's just kind of mind blowing you know yeah. and, and i i think that to me he's a very smart person um, and I, I, to me, I felt like finding Francis was almost like his, uh, his audition tape for HBO or something like he was like, okay, we're going to wrap up this comedy central and I'm going to move on to my next yeah. totally. platform. So he makes a really big statement yeah. yep. and you see him shift his character again, you know, he down, cause he, he's still doing a lot of the awkward stuff on Nathan for you. Like, let you know, let's, let's hold hands or whatever, I'm making guys hold hands or whatever, be awkward, but he got on. And finding Francis, he starts to kind of let some of that go. I feel like, and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it is yeah, a anyways. bridge between uh, Nathan for you and the rehearsal. Definitely, that's what's. If you're a fan of Nathan Fielder or uh, want to get more into it, this uh, show, um, uh, Finding Francis, it really is. It's like l- really, literally a bridge. Like there's a there's an absolute connected tissue between, like one foot and where he's been with Nathan for you, and one foot where he's going with uh, the rehearsal. Um, and yeah, it's a and strange place. It's, <clears throat> it's, 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 there's a huge difference. Let me just put it this way between the last episode of the rehearsal and the first episode of Nathan for you. <laughs> it's a chasm. 
Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah. <clears throat> you know, and for those of you who may be listening to this who haven't seen Nathan for you, you know, it is sort of like I was saying, like a kind of parody of these, you know, business improvement reality shows where he basically goes out and he pitches. He's kind of a straight man, kind of comedian in a way, but he's also like very awkward, very, uh, he can be like gentle, but pushy and arrogant, but also insecure. And um, he's very desperate to be liked, but also like has an inability to understand like why he's not, you know, and socially uh, just yeah. like lost, yeah. you know, yeah, socially so lost. Yeah. Yeah. So there's 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 a lot of self-deprecating humor. But at the same time, he's coming up with these very absurdist ideas to improve, uh, you know, people's businesses that he goes to great ambitious lengths to um, to achieve. And some of them have gone on to create, you know, viral buzz because they're so outrageous and ridiculous. Um, and then, but, 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 but like the show itself kind of has this weird effect where, you know, sometimes it can feel mean spirited where like, you know, he's kind of taking <laughs> pretty much advantage of these people. And, but there's also this weird other meta layer where it's like, all of this is like in the outer boroughs of Los Angeles. And so like, you know, there's an awareness of like cameras and reality TV. And so like people want to be on TV mm-hmm. And and people are people are are, are are accepting of the camera, and so it, it really plays. Just I think uh, I think you have to kind of look at it uh, from a bird's eye view because it is more of a commentary, not just on like reality TV, but like people and television and our expectations. Yeah, modern and, media. You're modern right. Modern media. It's our hopes true. and it's, dreams. It's true. Like they, they, their radius is very small. Like it, they, the outer limits for this show where they would shoot is like really like San Bernardino, maybe, but like, like mostly Calabasas. it's like Glendale and Burbank, mm-hmm. you know, like, like mm-hmm. I go by like locations for that Nathan for you all the time around here, you know, in LA. But um, right. I, it's funny you should get into that because like um, you mentioned Borat, like, and, and, and mean spiritedness, you know, like, like maybe yeah. one of the, uh, the traits of, of Nathan can look um, mean spirited and, you know, mocking towards the, the other people, the, the subject. It's funny because Borat, it, that is just mean. It's a very cruel show, you know. Like uh, he's very harsh to the to, to his, uh, you know, they call it marks. Like his marks are are. Uh, it's very ruthless, and it is all for the sake of the joke, and um, it's all pitch black comedy. But Nathan has added this innovation where it can have a Boratish kind of like. Um, you know, uh, uh, mistreatment of the subjects of the marks, but it has more vulnerability and it's a little warmer. Like he's often bonding in sort of these sideways ways with the yeah. people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so I find that really compelling and, and, and an yeah. innovation from Borat, which is just cruel and mean. Right. And it's like a big black and white thing between the, the, the Joker and all these subjects you know right a lot of time um, with with sasha like he's he's got like a political kind of edge to it too yeah. and he's like exposing somebody's totally. bigotry or something and there's like right virtually, right there's not really much of that in nathan like it's pretty uh but the audience is completely different too like sasha feels like a big broader audience and nathan fielder's audience does feel more like yeah you know, cult um yeah 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 um, well he also is smartly I think too. He has a self awareness enough. I think in most of the episodes, like I like I think the ones that are the most uh, <clears throat> harsh, shall we say, towards the subject, he does yeah. smartly find a way to make it all about himself at the end, where he right. like, like 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 the jokes all on him, or he's right. really the sad and lonely. He's more sa- he's sadder and lonelier than the person is, mm-hmm. you know. So That's he at true. least does craft that into right. It. I'll, I'll, I feel like a lot of times too the people like the, sometimes they are like real wild characters but sometimes they just have like a really dry blank reaction to him or to yeah. the events that he set up around them you know and I feel like that's like something that he looks for in casting is like sure like not people that are huge characters because you can't it's like bananas on bananas if you have two people that are just like you know yeah. um but a lot of times like 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 Bill for instance in in Finding right. Francis he has a really dry reaction to the absurdist you know plans that nathan puts in front of him you know and like and a lot of the characters in the show too like he'll uh, you know the show has this like a cascading series of events or he'll have a cascading plan of like we've got to get michael richards to tip at this restaurant but we can't get the real uh, michael richards so we'll have a we'll have a guy 
go in there who looks like Michael Richards to so leave a giant tip. That way we'll get a lot of media attention to this restaurant. But Jeez. but what if someone looks into it? We'll have to get the guy, to, another guy to change his name to Michael Richards so we can get a credit card and then credit register card, the credit yeah. card. But to get that credit card, we need some burner phones. We'll hire a guy to get some burner phones and take them to well, the, you know, you like know, there's this huge cascading series of like events that um, uh, with his plan that keeps getting more and more absurd. And then he takes it back to the people you know, at the at the restaurant, and they're kind of like, "Yeah, that sounds good." They have a really dry reaction to like, right, right. like what his plan is, and like, that is hilarious. Okay. <laughs> it's hilarious to watch their plan because he's got this really absurd thing going on. They're like, "Okay, we'll do that." You yeah, know? I know what yeah. you mean. Like, we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> yeah, no, totally. Um, actually, he, it gets almost into that realm of like, um, like non-comedy, anti-comedy, that kind of stuff that we like playing with here. Uh, we mentioned it briefly with King of Comedy we recently did, where it's like. Um, is this even humor? Is this even funny? And I guess what I'm trying to say is like, what when you're describing back to me, like the process of him with that show about having to have the name change so they can get the credit card and that the fake Mike Richards, it's um, it really absurdity is the word. And, 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 and that's another element. It's the compounding absurdity and really his subject mm-hmm. in a weird way with uh, Nathan for you, all of it, except what we're talking about today. But Nathan, for you, typically to me, is the, the, the real mark, the real subject, the real victim is reality itself. Yeah. And he's making it like, you know, like, like vibrate and kind of like ring weirdly and become in a regular shape. Again, every episode, except Finding Forrester, which inherently starts Finding on a different footing. <laughs> Finding Forrester, holy shit. It's fi- you're, Tom, it's you're Finding Nemo. It's Finding Nemo. Okay? No, 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 hold on. You're the man now, dog. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Forrester. Yeah, Forrester. Oh, my God. You're the man now, dog. Take uh, two. But, yeah, no. uh, but, so, no. uh, so no, Finding Francis has, has a footing, on, has a more earnest footing <laughs> in the first place because he's only occasionally sort of playing with reality, quote unquote. Right. The way he mm-hmm. really maximizes that. In, uh, otherwise, in Nathan's well, view, which is that, that the first time I saw Finding Francis, <clears throat> I was like, "Wow, he's not doing the compounding Michael Richards credit card thing." Quote unquote. No, I mean he's um, he's he's really, uh, yeah, he sort of saw an opening or an opportunity to investigate something and went for that ride, you know. And um, maybe one last thing I was going to say, just to connect us to Finding Francis, so we can get to the matter at hand, is also like you know reality TV. Um, you know, and of course, Nathan for you, but reality TV in general is also a perfect sandbox to sort of find the most eccentric, crazy people, you know, that, that exist, you know, and to sort of, you know, put them on television and examine them and, you know, and examine the quirkiness and all that stuff. And, and obviously you see a whole host of people like that on Nathan's sh- stuff. And, um, Bill Heath probably stands out as, one of the more um you know interesting eccentric dudes that has ever been on uh, anything and i guess we should get into him should we get into this i mean should we do it let's go all right let's build it up all right so basic so basically you know finding francis opens with um a scene where nathan fielder is recording a commentary track it's already getting very meta a commentary track for Nathan for you for a DVD release of his own TV show. And he brings on Bill Heath to do the auto commentary. And Bill Heath in a previous episode of the show played, I guess he at one point told Nathan he was a Bill Gates impersonator. And I'm sure that caught his attention and he brought him on the show. And there's a really hilarious scene. And Nathan for you, where, you know, Bill is basically like doing his, his Bill Gates shtick, right, Tom? (laughs) It's like, which I'll be honest, uh, if it wasn't presented as a Bill Gates impersonation, I would have never thought that that's what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, of because right. he's like, in the 80s, our computers were huge. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. it, is a, it is an old man who's old, way older looking than Bill Gates. A, yes. He doesn't do the voice of Bill Gates, which is insane. He doesn't look like Bill Gates. And he's saying things about computers that are um, <laughs> sort of all thumbs. Like he's like, in the 80s, there were enormous computers. And now they're not enormous. When we started our computers um, back in the 80s, it was huge in a business. They were huge machines. You know, and so uh, he's, <laughs> he's got some kind of weird vocalization. Bill has a very unique way of speaking. But it in no way or shape or form relates in any way to Bill Gates, the man. So, in other words, it's brilliant and it's 
Nathan Fielder catnip. It's perfect. You know? Exactly. His appearance. I think they were casting brief, brief for. <laughs> I think they were casting for impersonators on that episode, yeah. you know, because like, oh. they need somebody for it's. A, it's a, I think it's at a Hollywood like uh, souvenir, souvenir shop. shop, and they yeah. want yeah. they want celebrities around. So they have like they're a making the movie. Uh, they're, they're making. Um, they're telling people who are buying stuff at the store that they're make, that they're uh, in a movie. Is that it? Remember? Yeah, I, yeah. I, they 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 stage a fake production of a movie. Um, in order to get people to want to go into the store and purchase things, oh, but they're purchasing right. things for real to help the store. <laughs> it's sort of like you just you buy know. gum and cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and yeah. I, I gotta but, say, yeah. Bill, Bill, the Bill Gates of personality it happens twice actually. <clears throat> like he, I love it. Nathan brings him back for the uh, really sad party where there's no one else except Nathan and the woman who's a party thrower. And right. then they get the Bill Gates impersonator, and there's all these balloons, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. a boombox right. with like uh, disco music, planner. yeah. And that's yeah. awesome. That's another. Good Bill it Gates is really moment. savvy because he's like he's planting the seed of that character because he knows he's going to bring him back like in the final episode, I guess. Do you? Right? Like he. Well, I'm, I'm I'm thinking that he is because he's you know he's got a through line through it, and it, I think oh, I think it was organic. In mind, you know? I'm I, I well the the opening. Of you don't think they had the last episode like thought out like. You know, I don't, I don't think so. <clears throat> I don't think so. Evidence of this is his previous season finale, which is another epic, you know, where Nathan assumed the identity of kind of a, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of loser guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, Kevin Excel, <laughs> yeah, it's it, incredible. It, it's incredible to try and change his life, to make him a hero in the, in the eyes of his family and friends <laughs> and everything. It's very dark, very disturbing, um, but um, that took six months to do, you know, in order wow. to pull this thing off. So I think a lot of what he's doing is, um, you know, uh, is I mean, yeah, it's so ambitious and it's going so far. And I think with this, it was at a point where he knew that he was done with Nathan for you. I think that they wanted to make more. I think I read Comedy Central wanted to make more and he was done with it and wanted to do something mm-hmm. else. And he, he kind of... Uh, he, he kind of uh, beelined right into producing that other guy's show, How To, you know, with John Wilson or whatever it is. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. This, I think, came out... The, the, the concept for this, I do believe, was organic in terms of when they were recording this commentary track. Bill Heath, the supposed Bill Gates impersonator, had dropped that he was regretful over not marrying this woman <laughs> something to bring up on a commentary track too 50 years ago uh, you know mothers a lot of mothers have you picked out the girl they want you to marry well it doesn't work that way and then <clears throat> and then of course you know bill just starts popping up at the office all the time and talking to people right. about francis 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 reading you know? getting snacks yeah yeah that is a right. very Hollywood thing. I remember working at an office, and a guy would come by that we worked with once on a, a project. Would come by repeatedly and try to bring shoes to the women that worked in the office, things like that. It would just come by all the time. I, I totally recognize that in Bill, like kind of a hanger on, trying to capture that a little bit of that you know, Hollywood, fever. <laughs> Hollywood yeah. pizzazz. I also yeah. Th- yeah. think too, like you know, if if he's coming in, he's talking about this. You know, Nathan is savvy and smart enough to to basically be like, okay, like this could be you know an episode. You know, did we know it's going to be two hours? I don't know. Um, right, but also no. You, you were just saying though, like I think um, Nathan was getting bored with Nathan for you. Yeah, and he was maybe looking for kind of anything that he could uh, apply a, a new outlook for mm-hmm. his creativity, which wound up being the rehearsal. And like, I think he was just like, um, I could, we could drill down on any number of my bit players and it probably would be kind of interesting and rewarding, but let's, we'll do Bill, you know? Uh, because I think that, um, I mean, it's so, just to be emphasized this one last time, there's Nathan for you and then there's this episode. It's wildly different. Not just wildly. that it's, you know, feature yeah. length, but it, it's, um, it's just so tonally different that if uh, you played it for me, I wouldn't think that it was a Nathan for you episode. It technically is, but it really isn't. You know, it's sort of like you know, like she loves you. I want to hold your hand. Is Nathan for you? And this is like the White Album. You know, <laughs> Francis. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. 
So then basically, uh, you know, Nathan throws the resources of the show at trying to figure out who, where Francis is. Is she alive? Is she, is she, is she dead? Where is she? Is she married? Is she not? What's going on? It's been 50 plus years. And so they travel all the way back to Arkansas where Bill is from. And, um, man, it's just like right off the bat (laughs) and and just, and just like kind of getting to know Bill as a guy in this show too is, is just like all of his idiosyncratic sort of musings, um, you know, and and the way he says, like, what's your takeaway? Like your impression of him? Well, I mean, he's definitely got something going on, you know, like, like he's got he's he's got some uh there's a there's a facade a persona yeah and i feel it was hard to crack that like i wasn't seeing a lot of true emotion from him it was it would happen here and there especially in the last the phone call at the end but um he's got such a strange reserved you know he is like a bad actor like he's a failed actor so he he has this pretense of his social persona mm-hmm. is and it's exemplified by the formal way he talks mm-hmm. you know but that that is just the way he is maybe that is him well, you know what i mean i don't know yeah i was him. right here uh-huh. she came in that way i was behind the counter here okay she brought her tape recorder that's the last time i saw her yeah. Kind of sp- is he on? Is like on the spectrum or something? Like, because he I, seems I to have like I don't some know problems enough. relating with people. I don't yeah. either. But yeah, he know. seems like he has some problems relating with p- other people's emotions, and like he seems yeah. very self. He's point. very not saying that this is a characteristic of someone on the spectrum, but him as a person is very right. self-centered. He doesn't seem no, to have anybody. Can I give like, you an example, Mark? Is what you're saying? It's a very good point you're making. Like sure. he's. Um, sort of he doesn't have a tuning fork for social interaction so good mm-hmm. you know or it's, it's ringing wrong like, right because i remember right guys nathan they're you know in the first night of the same motel and nathan's like uh, well what's like a special memory you have with you and francis and he's like in the bed when you were on the bed together yeah what did you do on the bed well i was trying to have sex with her <laughs> yeah, He's trying to have intercourse with her. <laughs> yeah, and of course Nathan's like, oh, cool. Like, yeah, you know, <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah. And, and I was like, I just rewatched that actually that scene, and I was just like, yeah, that's yeah. pretty um, clueless. Like, uh, well, it's like no one you shouldn't say that kind of thing. Well, like, even I also, if that's yeah. true, or or, 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 or <laughs> feather it up a little bit, like you know, like right. our quiet moments together. But it's like in the bed. You know? Yeah. What do you think I was doing? Yeah. Like. Uh, yeah. There. There is. Um. I. I think too with him. It's like something's going on. Man. Something's going on. But I do think Nathan also. There is a kinship, to some extent too, yeah. because I also do think and and Nathan explores this very thoroughly in 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 his show the rehearsal is about his inability to connect with people and right. he sort of has that issue as well too and um there's a great new york magazine article profiling nathan fielder leading up to the release of the rehearsal and it's the most revealing thing kind of about him is who he really is and um Mm -hmm. like he 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 grew up like in you know vancouver and um as i was mentioning earlier um you know, he, he sort of like he went to like an all Jewish like elementary school or like even up to middle school, I think. And um, then he went to a, a normal public school and was like not couldn't engage with anybody at that level. And, 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 and to get his socialization moving ahead, that's when he studied and learned magic and magic tricks were his way to like <laughs> connect. with That people. always works. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, it's an icebreaker. Well, it, well it's yeah. a classic, quote unquote, icebreaker. Right. Uh, it's a clueless tool. You know, right. for the socially awkward to try to break ice. Um, that's this. Right. I, I see where you're going with this. this. is very interesting to me because I think whatever the reasons for Nathan of his uh, maladjustment socially, uh, you know, it seems like something that he is wrestling with in a comedic way and maybe in a more yeah. earnest way as we move further with the rehearsal. But he probably did see something in Bill. So this allowed him to have some empathy. But then again, the big question I always have um, with uh, with him always, including rehearsal and this, Finding Francis, is uh, how sincere is any of this? Because there's the Nathan Fielder in quotation marks, and then there's the human being Nathan Fielder. And he, I mean, it's inherent in the setup, you know, like yeah. he is 
playing himself, quote unquote, but it's not quite him he's, ever. He's an exaggerated person of himself for TV. Like he's playing a, an exaggerated version. Is he? Yeah, definitely. Know? Yeah, well, I, I think so. Well, I, he's, 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 he has, Nathan Fielder is playing an ex, he's playing an exaggerated version of himself. But we don't know what, him like personally, well, you know. Well, no, we don't. But he has said that in an interview before. Um, Can you trust him? Yeah. <laughs> well, we did. Hey, we did meet him once, and uh, right, and he was similar to this character. He was quiet, but I mean, he, he did seem similar to this character. He didn't seem like he was backstage going like chomping right. on a cigar, being like, yeah, "I totally yeah. did." You know, he wasn't like a baby. Crusty the clown. Yeah. yeah like, right. Yeah. yeah, he was okay. pretty similar. You know, okay. and I think, and I think, like, because of a lot of the show deals with awkwardness and. Uh, social interaction and he and he always writes himself in and he always writes himself someone to play off of because he's exploring his own mentality you know he's exploring his own psyche i think yeah. throughout all of his work you know and you yeah. totally see i mean it, it's never laid more clear for me than in finding francis because he actually writes himself like a, like a mirror uh, of bill's relationship with francis and he writes himself in you know what's it macy is that her name yeah the, with the uh, escort he has like a relationship that he it gives himself a love interest and someone to play off of so he can ab- examine himself, you know, in the same way that can Bill I, is being examined on. Well, you have something to say. Uh, uh, well, go ahead. I didn't know where you're going. Uh, okay. Just, well, I'm just trying to wrap it up. So, um, yeah, I, I think he writes himself a character. He writes himself a character to explore the same thing that he's exploring in Bill to explore in himself through Macy, totally. you know. So I, I think still that, think there's, a, there's an uber – Nathan, over all of it, that is uh, that, that we're not we're not he's not letting anybody in to the to the to the um, the super mm. ego, Nathan. I don't think so, and I would be surprised if yeah. he would be that vulnerable. I think he's always in control, even in his expression. Of right. Vulnerable. I'm not saying he's oh. vulnerable, but I think he's exploring that, those things. You know, he's that, yeah, he's always guarded. That's for sure. You know, he's right. always a character because even when even when you see the character break. You know, right. or you're supposed you're supposed to see him break. Right. He's not doing it perfectly. You know, he still has a little bit of that. You can see that he's acting yeah. like I'm going to act like I'm no. that I like you or something. You know, for a moment. Right. Well, there, that's the you thing. Know? You know, we're talking now. You mentioned Macy, right? Like he gives himself mm-hmm. a love interest. Let's be clear, it's an escort. Okay. Yeah. So this, so th- th- there's something going on here because it's an escort who's hired initially for Bill to mm-hmm. help him with. To, to gauge his socialization, by the with way, women, right. with he women, rejects, yeah. he rejects the escort outright. So then he starts seeing Nathan Fielder, starts seeing Macy the escort. But the thing you got to think about, or I'm thinking about, is Macy the escort is doing something where guess what? She's not ever necessarily being her true self, even when she might be saying, you know, I'm really having a good time right now. Yeah, I know. Hand. I know. Like, absolutely. The clock's yeah. ticking, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's so I, I, I obviously did that on purpose, you know, because yeah. this this show ends with hand holding of two people who have intents that are outside of being authentic with each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, now she might yeah. actually have caught feelings for well, Nathan Fielder. We should explain um, this or not, for the viewers. We should we should explain. We should explain okay. this real fast. Marcus, just put a pin for a second. We should explain just that, as you were saying, you know, the escort was for Bill to, in case we find Francis, here's another woman you can play off of kind of in a rehearsal type yeah. manner Rehearse. to see, right. to sort of see how Bill is going to interact with another woman, you know, because let's be real. He's been pretty creepy up to this point and we should get into I, some of that. But yeah. Stalker. Yeah. You think I'll look like a stalker? Yeah, yeah we'll it's a tough subject. That. But yeah. then Nathan I, basically sw- swoops in and starts to develop a side relationship with the escort and is sort of exploring his own sort of loneliness. Um, and the only thing I'll add to it, and I'm going to throw to you what you wanted to say, Marcus, is also evidence in the New York Magazine piece is his colleagues do shout him out. Uh, shout out Nathan for being uh, a brilliant, uh, for being a genius in the edit room in terms of pulling narratives out of countless hours of completely incoherent footage. Like he knows how to tell these stories and maybe what a story needs in order to work. And I think that for me, the Macy subplot is something that really helps fill out the the two hour runtime and also makes a broader a, a broader statement about about relationships and 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 everything. It, and it ends on that note. It ends with them, yeah. not with yeah. Bill. But with them. Yeah. 
I, I, at first I was worried when she gets introduced, I was worried that it was just going to be something to pad it, you know, but it, but it ends up having like carrying some of the major themes and, and Tom, I think you're totally right. She's an escort and an escort is like someone who is acting in everyday life, right? Like you have to act, but, but when you, but guess what? When you're a really good actor, it's cause you're being really good at being yourself, you know, in front of a whole room of people, you know what I mean? Like. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, so I think that, you know, she's really hardcore at being herself. I think she's, she's very smart. She has the, Too sweet. I found that she had, we talk about how sometimes, she? The, yeah. sometimes we talk about how people have like uh, the, the, a character in the film will like say the theme or give a line that's talking to the, to the audience, you know? Mm-hmm. And she has that line where she's admonishing Nathan saying, you lied to every one of these people. She's watching his show. What do you mean? You lied to every last one of them. I mean, it's You're business. You're like mean funny. <laughs> it's business, right? Mm-hmm. right? She's like, I like it, but you lied to everybody, you know? Mm. Um, which is also sort of a commentary on, you know, being an actor and television making. You know, so much of it is tied up being a uh, television, but sure. I found her relationship with him to be really kind of affecting in a way like it's even though he's paying her, you know, up front, we see him every time, give her the money, and then they have a <laughs> yeah. little time together. She's so sweet, kind of flirting with them. And I feel like the audience, as an audience member, we get a little bit of serotonin, dopamine release from watching that rom-com energy between them, even though we are told that she's an escort who's being paid. And we know that he, you know, this is just a, a, mo- a, 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 a reality show. And she's on camera. She's on camera too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like there's and, compounding falsities. Yeah. Like but I think her, what, her trade in general in the context sad. of reality television. It's kind of sad. Yeah, too. well I I think the I think it's mm-hmm. making a broader statement about like relationships and like what you bring to them because like you know Bill is like so in love with Francis and we we think it's like this huge um, uh relationship but we come to find out in the movie most of it's in his head by the end of it, right? She doesn't even remember who it is. And but it felt very real to Bill and it felt like the fire was still burning for Bill, you know. And I feel feel like with the with the Macy thing, we're getting a dose of like serotonin from them and dopamine from them kind of flirting, even though we know it's a fake relationship. So I feel like there's some sort of like it's inversely mirroring Bill's relationship, talking about how mm. you know your ideas of love can produce actual true like emotions, even yeah. if it is just complete fantasy. You know, mm-hmm. and yeah. I, I don't. So I thought the Macy plot was had a really deep edge. Mm. I agree. It. I agree yeah, too. It's, ma- it's masterful. And again. When I first saw it, I was so happy that it did end with them. And it, by the way, when I say ends with Macy and Nathan, um, you know, she's like, uh, maybe we skip the cameras. And he's like, OK, how about just one camera like the uh, the, the drone? And that's the, I, and so he can't let it go completely. You know, no, um, no, of course not. So, so for him, the significance of Dude. Uh, he couldn't let go in, in the concept of this show. Um, uh, he couldn't let go of the concept of the show. <laughs> you know right, what I mean? Right. Like, like it shows that he has a neurosis to truly like, like l- let all the veil go down and be, I am this guy named Nathan and nice to meet you, Macy. And like, it's always, and also he's in control. There's a control element to Nathan. Always. He needs to be in control. Yeah. You know, right. like he's running and she's, she gets into that too, a little bit, Macy, like, like, you know, this is all in your context, which is something, cause it's not just that he's, in this there's not a third party that nathan is involved in this is his little world which is reflected in the first episode of the rehearsal where he's where they play that great brilliant uh, thing of uh, imagination uh, pure imagination from um really wonka mm-hmm. you know because that's what uh, the uh yeah you know the guy the trivia night guy says like you're really wonka yeah yeah and yeah. that i don't think there was a better metaphor for that i thought it was brilliant because yeah. this is Nathan's little playground. It is. You know, yeah. and I think he, he likes that. And it's very unfair to anyone who enters Nathan's playground <laughs> yeah. because he's uh, yeah. shooting it and editing it. Like you said, which yeah. I think is even more significant than shooting all of it. Like you said earlier, Marcus, like he's the ringmaster of the reality being shaped by, in the editing bay in post. Yeah. So um, no one has a chance uh, because he is giving, he's giving us the Macy that he wants to give you. Right. Holy shit. There's a lot going on here. Yeah. Oh, totally. There's tons going on. And yeah. Uh, Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. I was just going to say, yeah, he's absolutely feeling like he's sculpting reality, molding it as he goes and withhold like we he's withholding information from us until a certain time, you know, whatever. So like 
because it's uh, that's how you that's that's movie ma- making. Right? Oh man, you know we gotta tell a good what, story. You know, here's my mind blower. That's what we all do in here. <laughs> you know, whoa, uh, like we're, um, we're all John, we're all Malkoviching out. You know, like everything is <laughs> in our own context <laughs> by the nature of you know yeah. consciousness. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, so he's doing an uh, like an externalized abstract form of um, Malkoviching reality. Yeah, which well, is, I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna Malkovich. I'm going to Malkovich real quick, too, because I also seeing the clock and there's so much I want to get oh, to. So Christ. I have to I have to be the ringleader here to some extent, too. But right. uh, the, the, the one fielder this episode. I got a Nathan just for a minute. But the, the one thing I, I, I do want to say, I think we should put a bow on Macy and we should move on also to, yeah, yeah. Moving on. you know, all the bill shit I want to get to. Um, but the last thing I'll say, just to shout out the scene, because it literally the it's 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 a real testament that the cringiest scene in this whole fucking um or at least the scene for me that cringes me out the most even is 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 with nathan and not with with bill is the scene when nathan is dancing that awful song uh for macy and then and then their kissing is so hard for me to watch christ's sake i can't lingers on it oh it's it's like uh it's like it goes several beats too long it's like wow it's like his, 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 that the way he kisses is so strawberries. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. It's horrible. Um, anyway, so, uh, but let's, let's, let's yeah, Bill. get into just some of the bill scenes that are, oh man, there's so many, but basically, Hard um, bill. yeah. And uh, well, you, when you well, were talking about, well, unless there's a place you want to go, just, I was just going to shout out the, good. this one particular scene, because I mean, we were talking, I think we were speaking quite in, we were, we were tiptoeing on Bill a little bit. I think you're asking what we think of him. I do think he's creepy. I mean, we have to acknowledge that he's okay. fucking creepy. I, I don't know. Do you guys think he's creepy? I think he's creepy. I, I don't know. I'm on the fence. I didn't warm up to him. Do you I, I thought at first, like, hardcore creep. But then I didn't warm up to him, but I didn't think he was so much a creep. I just think he has – he's he's calcified in his old age and wind, has wound up having a very strange – formal for whatever reason a very strange formal way of addressing others and being well, social and it's very unnatural and it makes it tragically impossible him for probably to be too close to anybody because he's built up this strange wall and i don't think his i, don't, I mean what does creepy mean maybe i'll just put it that way like well, like it's creepy in that he is not regular folks like the three of us talking right now hey we're friends we're talking blah 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 and it's warm and like loose and like you know if i was being bill right now i'd be like Yes, that was very interesting, wasn't it? Well, what was that scene where he meets yeah. the... Um, where, where, it's hard where, to where relate he, to. Well, there's that scene where he meets it's the... It's creepy, though. He, he meets the woman that's, you know, going to play Francis in the rehearsal of their um look uh, at their her thing. teeth yeah that's what it was yeah he goes he Great goes teeth. yeah look at her teeth and he goes he goes Thank you got you. nice teeth it's so long since Ooh, you've seen her look at her right? teeth oh. Oh, look at them <laughs> You got them all. They're yours. Yes, they're Nothing fake. They're- you got them all. They're yours. <laughs> That's what he yeah. said. Yeah. <laughs> you got them all. <laughs> nice Yikes. Impression, by the way. Yeah. Well, you know, I was, uh, was going to say is, guys, That's uh, let's drill down on that incredible scene, uh, the setting. Well, before A, we do. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. But, because before we do, I wanted to ask you, when we, because I showed you this this finding francis tom in in the flesh you you and i watch this together who did i say Mm -hmm. that mr bill uh reminded us of which was you know well the second the second you said it i went of course because it was in the back of my mind like in the middle of uh of of finding uh you just went robert durst and i went oh shit Uh, like like he he bears a resemblance (laughs) but it's not just that they also have the and the black eyes I know. And so that's not good. I mean, let's not throw Bill under the bus and imply that he's a serial killer. <laughs> no. Because no. Victor's killed people. No, no. But um, yeah. he has it is more than just age. It is more than Fred Durst, by the way. Uh, Robert Robert Durst. Fred? Yeah. yeah. Fred, Fred Durst is a little different. Yeah. Robert Fine. Durst. Right. Yeah. A different yeah. psycho. <laughs> is it, uh, yeah, I don't know. 
Well, let, let, <laughs> let's talk about this killer scene. So this is basically the audition tape yeah. for the rehearsal, um, which is, is a scene. It's really my favorite scene in the whole freaking thing. incredible. Which, of course, I'm sure Nathan at that moment had a light bulb went off in his head and was like, this could be, a enti- yeah. this could be a show. This whole thing could let's, be a show. Let's extrapolate this yeah. and move and, Make it and, show. and do like this yeah. for like, you know, nine episodes. Right. But, so what it uh, is, yeah. So, so, is, yeah. yeah, it's basically... Please describe the setting, though. Yeah, so the set, I will. So the setting is, <clears throat> you know, he, you know th- they found Francis, right? And they're going to go to Michigan, I think, is where she lives. And they found her. Of course, she's married, but yes. they have to rehearse... Well, how Bill is going to interact interact with her when they see each other for the first time in 50 plus years. So, of course, Nathan finds an actress that looks like her that's going to assume the role of Francis. And then, you know, Bill is going to do this. And then, of course, brilliantly, <laughs> he lets Brilliant. he, he lets Bill have full creative reign on the first take of, well, what are you going to do? And it's really one of the most oh, like, please, please help us with the setting, though, or I'll do it. <clears throat> Go it's for it. Like, Nathan, yeah, okay. Nathan, this is what kills me. This is where uh, he's a genius, and like you can't. Uh, this is as good as any like work of art. They decide to do these rehearsals where Bill is rehearsing with an actress, and they're like, "Well, what's local? What could we do?" Oh, okay. There's this. There's this local stage. They do productions. They're currently doing. Uh, what are they doing? Oh, they're doing Young Frankenstein, the musical. So, so on this set that is a castle with a castle door, like not, you know, not a living room, you know, not a typical sitcom living room, but it's like a fucking castle that kills me. There's something like a about dungeon. That. Yeah. It's like, it's like a dungeon castle, uh, living room and, in, in, you know, for this, it's, it's like a, yeah, in place of the suburban home. And yes. Uh, and there's some, um, role playing that goes on that we really responded to. Oh my God. Uh, well, Bill comes out like in the, in the first, you know, take with no direction from anybody. And it's this really aggressive, touchy, grabby, uh, off putting, creepy <laughs> sort of version of what he's is in the red on that one. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah, totally. And so then they kind of work to refine him. Um, and then I think the Eureka moment, which is just a stroke of brilliance and it's just a funny visual it's a hilarious Terrible. visual but it's also Terrible. poignant is when he plays francis the role reversal we have we have bill playing francis and then the actress playing francis playing bill and bill has this ridiculous wig on um it looks like um what's that comedian um you know help uh, me out it looks uh, like um it oh, looks like uh, Emo Phillips. Uh, Thank you. I, I'm thinking yeah. Jennifer. The, <laughs> that kind of a Jennifer Aniston uh, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Friends. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And um, and and that's just an incredible moment. He finally starts to get it, and by the end, they're all really hopeful yeah. that he's gonna fucking yeah. do this. But it's such a brilliant exercise, and obviously, you yeah. could see right then and there that that was gonna be, um, you know, ostensibly the genesis for what his next show would be. Right. I, yeah. Absolutely. I think it's like, you know, I think Nathan knows that Bill is locked in his ways. He's not going to evolve and change, you know, but I think, but Nathan knows that this movie needs someone. The character has to go through some sort of change, right? He, that's very like a uh, rule of thumb. So I feel like he is building in those moments to give Bill some room to grow. Totally. And the punctuation is at the end when he brings that woman back who he did the role playing with. Those and they, great teeth. And they go on the, the, with the great teeth that are still that are actually hers still, and they go on a date together to like a Mexican restaurant or something, you know, just so that we can have a little. We as the audience can have a little hope that You're Bill so right. could have a life outside of this, even though, like, you know, I'm sure oh. he's just back being Bill again. Yeah, hard you know? Bill. Yeah. No, but to, to your point though, I mean, that is a uh, you know a, a trope, you know, trope 101 of reality TV is have the shit land with like life lessons learned and you know end on like a, a light note you're so right like he's yeah. he's he commits to um a classic ending trope uh, well it's also uh, with, with it's bill like um like, like a new life for bill a, a second you know chance at romance some hope well, the, yeah. Well, the, yeah well the thing that's so cool about this too and 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 frightening at the same time is that mm-hmm. you know like okay. I, 
I would assume that like this project, Finding Francis, was a long endeavor. They probably were working on it the entire season of the show, right? Like I'm sure that the entire season they were chipping away at this and and having it evolve and shooting it, you know, over many trips and 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 obviously that is a reality show approach in order to sort of manufacture these beats, if you will, in the story to to, to basically create an arc for the character. Like we're gonna have him do this, he's gonna learn that. But there's something kind of amazing in that too and hey it's not just reality shows that do that um that 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 try to manufacture those moments or those beats it's like you know herzog also operates on that uh mechanic as well too i mean grizzly man is filled with all a lot of scenes where i mean he's inserted himself as sort of a nathan you know in a lot of ways and 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 but but you know but he he is making a film at the end of the day i mean herzog is very classic on record for you know taking documentary subjects and making them film characters you know and and that's a, that's sure. ostensibly what Nathan is doing here too and and it's it's cool to see and and it's to me it's exciting like that's such an exciting thing to make is like find a, somebody like Bill who is you know captivating and interesting and multifaceted you know we could say creepy yeah. but he's interesting to watch because you never get to see someone like yeah. fucking Bill on TV and um, he's a real character yeah he's a real character and then to really like you know explore that but then also kind of yeah weave these pathways in and out you know over the course of what i'm guessing was probably a year to make this right and like he might be you know we might be laughing at bill bill probably doesn't maybe bill doesn't know it's a comedy at first and then he doesn't care you know because he's getting some attention off of it he's finally getting to be an actor that people watch his movies from you know and uh and nathan is weirdly having an impact on his life you know like that he's yeah. he actually did find this long lost love for him yeah. and connect him you know so it, it is really interesting like you know what macy said are you you lie to these people but then he is having nathan's lampooning through nathan lampooning these people he's having like a real world of impact on their actual yeah. lives which is pretty especially bill because just to just to maybe address that like um there is a final moment here where they don't have on camera a face to face with Bill and Francis, um, right. but it's a phone call. Yeah, and uh, it's actually it's not funny. It's not played for laughs, and it's pretty poignant, and it's pretty intense. And he, and and you know Nathan lets it just basically more or less play out. They probably got rid of some. They trimmed it, but um, how do you guys feel about that? Like. Uh, mm. Because, 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 because Bill's Do going. Do you through know something. who this is? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Hi, who's calling? Well, I want you to guess. Oh, I can't. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you think hard. Doesn't my voice sound familiar to you? <laughs> and she's like, yeah. uh, "Is it uh, Jim Cutler? Yeah. Who? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It gets really <laughs> that, mad. That kind of killed me. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Like when she." was guessing wrong it's not right well, it's, she's like tell- are you she's like are you all right and he's like uh, am i well, all it sounds right? like he's like <laughs> well, yeah because it sounds like you know the call you get when um it's like it's terminal and you have yeah. like, four mm-hmm. weeks to live <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah. exactly but it's it's interesting like you know it's also kind of interesting to see like in that moment like there's a part of you when you're watching it like he's literally bill is outside her door in the car <laughs> And they found her and they and they have a phone conversation and they don't actually meet. You know, they don't actually physically meet in that moment, um, which is, you know, a bold choice. Like, I'm surprised, you know, because uh, like, you know, as a viewer, you're kind of a little bummed that you don't get to see that moment. But it is poignant yeah. that they don't. But then it's also like kind of interesting that Nathan, who is the Willy Wonka, as we sort of talked about, that actually, you know, let that moment be and actually didn't go to the next level to manufacture whatever the next crazy uh, mm-hmm. moment you'd get from that, you know, yeah. is. Right. I, know? I think he must plan out in some ways and then know, and then like knows there's going to be like some variables in it. But I sure. think like, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen or like Triumph, the insult dog, they've kind of thought out ahead of time what people's reactions might be yeah. and then come up yeah, with like a true. plan. They have a solid plan B, plan C. Yeah. And I'm sure Nathan had had an idea like, can I live with it if he just calls her on the phone? Right. You know, like, because right. um, he wasn't going to send the cameras up there anyway, at least initially. He said right. that, you know, and I think that you, of course, it's a great ending that he doesn't meet her. That's yeah. even better. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> they do interact and we are witness to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And which yeah. is which is satisfying. It would have been pretty actually you probably would have scrapped the whole thing if they never had any encounter like i could see them almost like i don't have an ending 
you know, I or can if imagine, she died, you know, or if they, she wasn't even living, some, right? Untraceable. Yeah, yeah they never, yeah. they never found right. her. They never found her. Right. Yet. Well, maybe but, the whole plan was for the audience to never see her. You know what I mean? Like the, that she could live in our minds, yeah, the way yeah. that she lives in Bill's or something. You know, you could right. see that being a yeah plan. Yeah, but it's you definitely know, one little thing uh, about well. his personality, though. Is uh, right after the phone call ends, and it's pretty heavy for him, obviously. Um, and then he asks Nathan, like, "How do you feel?" How do I feel? <laughs> the conversation. How do you feel? How do you feel? And then Nathan incredulously is just like, how do I feel? And that actually feels like real Nathan Fielder because yeah, you know, like, yeah. he thought that was a very strange thing. Like Bill's asking me, like, how do I feel? And I'm still trying to figure that out. Like, why would <laughs> like Bill's, which makes me think that Bill does he really does have some kind of disconnect maybe internally you know what i well, mean well i think he 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 was like he's just unable to process his emotions well, you know, too I, well yeah i do but I, I think bill was also aware of the fact that nathan's gone to such great lengths right. with the with the money and the, the production show. and everything yeah, with the show and it's like are you happy with this result that you know it's you know it's not but that's it's still not kind of a weird out. reaction you know like it is at least cool. i mean moment. it's like, that's such a weird the phone yeah, I mean, but it's such a crazy moment in his life, you know. I mean, well, he's got he's just gotten closure on this crazy thing, closure. you know. Yeah, right. Yeah. And Nathan's become one of the most important people in his life at that moment. Oh you know? yeah, you like uh, only friend. Yeah, for sure. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, except maybe yeah. some other Arkansas Razorback fans. So we, so we, so we, so we. I love when he's like being hypnotically regressed or whatever, and he's talking about the the Razorback games. You know, that oh, is dude, my favorite. That's demented. Yeah. I saw something on. Uh, I was I was when I was re you know googling around for this before we were recording. I noticed that like there was a Reddit thread where like some guy had found that Razorback game that he was he was he was nice. uh, recalling in his hypnosis that it was actually oh. really a, a, a moment <laughs> so yeah, wow. that's beautiful. yeah. actually you yeah. know we're running the clock is ticking I'm, I'm wondering maybe you know we're talking about bill's journey like and, and we're doing broad strokes kind of this whole show let's maybe drill down on some other killer moments like uh just throwing out there like the reunion oh yeah yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah of course which is another <laughs> fake thing he's impersonating someone uh, Bill's going as someone else to. Well, the uh, idea hurry. is, yeah, exactly. The idea is that, like, if there's a class reunion that, you know, Francis may go to, or people may know where Francis is from her high school, and they basically stage this, you know, class reunion, and then uh, Bill's going to go undercover as somebody from her high school, pretend and learn all the, you know, quirks and whatever of a particular person. He was track and field star yeah. glee club and then he Math uh club. <laughs> and then chess club and then uh, and then he uh he also performs the theme song uh of course uh from francis's high school yeah my name's john daddy from dumas and you all see me do my stuff Ding dong, daddy uh, from uh, Dumas. I, <laughs> ding dong, ding dong, daddy. Oh, from Dumas. daddy, daddy, daddy. Ah, oh, shit. I'm a ding dong, daddy from Dumas, and yeah. you really ought to see my stuff. Yeah, exactly. Incredible. I, so, I love how yeah. it also, that's another rule of thumb for filmmaking, right? It's like uh, adaptation or whatever. Like you get through it. Uh, Robert Key says, "Put some music in your uh, in your movie." Like yeah. the, Casablanca had a theme song or whatever. It's like he he sticks a good piece of music in his movie. There's there's a, there's right. a theme song. No, you're right. <laughs> Actually, I, I gotta say, you've got me stuck, Evan, since you've mentioned uh, Herzog, and like uh, that Ding Dong Daddy thing. Like like Werner Herzog would have definitely carved out time to have that in his movie. <laughs> you know, like like you know what yeah. I mean. He does that too. Like little standalone. Sure sort of strange like reality moments you know yeah well there's a the, kinship there i'm talking the about like you know we were talking about Great too point. i can't remember i can't remember how we characterize this in the herzog yeah. episodes we've done but just like the idea of like you know herzog is the type of he has the eye the keen eye uh, yeah, to sort of right. to, to, to sort of see poetry in in like excellent right. far eccentric people totally. you know and 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 to and to build moments from that and of course nathan does too obviously his is more in a hard comedy level but there's there is there is a lot of similarity in terms of that eye of being able to identify 
someone like a bill and like you know let's go let's go to the absurd length of like make a whole fucking film about bill you know which is what's great about right. this you know yeah i mean maybe I, it's so hard to separate like uh, a discussion of like filmmaking from nathan fielder's work because like he some some reason partly because it's so f out he pushes it so far forward listening to like royalty free music while he's driving or whatever on the show or it's always referencing some the filmmaking you know mm -hmm. but like i i feel like um uh you know there's it reminds me of that movie uh there's, there's a lot of, i think a good filmmaker like nathan filter understands that reality and documentary isn't real that it needs to be sculpted and it reminded me i'm gonna get cringe for a second reference that um ben stiller adam driver movie while we're young oh. the central oh. the discourse in that movie is Didn't like ben stiller's character thinks that it's like that you have to make a documentaries that are real everything's true and adam driver's like i played with the timeline and he makes up you know he makes a fake documentary right. and i think that part of it is just the realization that like filmmaking is filmmaking movie making is movie make, movie making it doesn't matter if it's a documentary or a narrative piece exactly. or action movie or whatever like you're sculpting yeah. it and this idea that everything has got to be real and uh is, is journalistic like, maybe but, a little, yeah, yeah. maybe a little yeah. naive i think yeah. a naive point of view to think yeah. that documentaries present real life exactly and i think i, I love that part of nathan's work is like bringing those ideas more to the surface you know right and um and like you're saying like making a connection between herzog and that it puts it really it's like demystifies filmmaking you know and just sort of like what uh, well, a peek behind the curtain for us average joes to see like that this right, is right. really what filmmaking is so the is mechanisms it, are, well, are if part I can, of the story if i can say before yeah. we wrap well, I was it just up gonna too. Say the spectrum i think there's a spectrum with docs like anything else which is very intriguing because frederick wiseman is about as close as you can get to a fly on the wall i mean very of course tight. there's always choices and number yeah. one is like editing you know yeah even if you have no music or something like that you know like um you, you know, you're choosing what's in and what's out. You didn't just mm -hmm. shoot every single. The only person he's who did that, dedicated to right. But I got to say, the only the only person who did do real time documentary reality was Andy Warhol. All kidding right. aside, Empire is the Empire <laughs> State Building for eight hours. Yeah, and that would be you just staring at it for eight hours. <laughs> yeah, there you, you know. Go. So that's it. Sleep. That's that's yeah. the this end of the spectrum. You know, so well, everything else does have choices. Let know. me. Let me just because I got three minutes on the clock, just a last topic to put a bow on all of this. Obviously, it's a great fucking piece. I urge everyone to see it if they have not seen Finding Francis. But Absolutely. it's as we keep mentioning, it is this great segue into his show, his his HBO show, um, um, Nathan's show, The Rehearsal. And, and I think what's great about The Rehearsal um, and what I really took away from that show, especially with this, you know, Finding Francis in mind, is that it really is a deconstruction of Nathan's process, of the way he makes things. It's really a deconstruction of his own work because he's he's dealing with the guilt of the things that he's done to people, the lies he's told people. That plays majorly into the themes of... Um, yeah. uh, it, um, into the rehearsal and everything. So I don't know, to me, it's just interesting. Like when we talk about Nathan's craft and everything and how, how far it has come, you know, up to finding Francis. And then with the rehearsal, it's just a complete deconstruction of what he does, yeah. you know? And of course it's it true. comes back at the end um, to be about him. So I don't know. I just think it's fascinating that, you know, even though Nathan for you gets meta, like it gets double, triple meta with the rehearsal in terms of him looking at his own, his own self and, and how he, constructs this his own weird realities <laughs> and i gotta say i i i, I totally agree I, I wouldn't i've always been a little suspicious of him in, in, in a fun way where i'm never not necessarily ever buying like his genuine feelings about like his compunctions with like his, the way his behavior in the past and his methods but i gotta say it transcends that by the end of the rehearsal when he's dealing with the little boy who is uh you know attached to nathan uh, being the fake father of the little boy that is some real shit. Yeah, and that is not cutesy. And he, what I mean is, Nathan's really feeling it. You see it on his face, and you hear it in his voice. And you can't fake that. And that's where it transcends and becomes a very special show because he has broken through the layers that he's created as a person yeah. and as a, as a creative artist. 
I also forgot to mention too, really quickly, was just you reminded me in the in the New York Magazine article, which I mentioned was the most revealing part of who Nathan really mm-hmm. is. During the second season of Nathan for You, he went through a very what sounded like tumultuous divorce, you know, and I think from there he started to go to therapy to understand how to connect more to people. That's a problem that he does have, and he's he talks about it, and and that is the central theme of you know all of his work his work is coming yeah. back on his inability to connect with other people and i think ultimately finding francis is about that connection mm-hmm. right and about that finding that connection you know and so at the end of the day it's funny but it's also extremely poignant so right yeah. amazing he's connecting with people on a lot much larger scale though and i'm just for one very thankful to have someone doing interesting work in this day and age that's pushing boundaries you know yeah totally absolutely he's he's definitely one of those that is that is true. All right, everybody. That was one fucking hour on Nathan for you finding Francis. We did it. Um, there yeah. it is. So, that was cool. um, yeah, something a little bit different, um, but mm-hmm. you know, all the same at the same time. Um, so, he's, I think he's one of the most uh, interesting people on the the uh, the landscape of uh, on the, the scene. arts right now. On I the mean, scene, I, I yeah. look forward to what yeah. he's doing next. I, yeah, you know, I, I got to cheat and say a shout out to Forensic Files that he was watching Forensic Files when he's in the hotel room. Uh, another <laughs> oh, documentary yeah, about. that's right. Yeah. Good cheat, though. <laughs> and, two, uh, and, and it's a double effer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Finding a, Forrester. A double effer with a double effer right. in the middle. Another documentary. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Finding Forrester Finding starring Forensic Fred Durst. File Forrester. Finding yeah. Forrester <laughs> Forensic Files. <laughs> anyway. All right. Anyway, so that was that. That was a good time, everybody. Thanks for listening to that. Yeah. Um, again, I, I'm going to say it one more time, everybody. Do you want a piece of pizza? Help me find oh it. God. Help me find well, it. That well, is my see. Francis. I'm looking here online. People are already chiming in. Uh, no, I'm kidding. That is my Francis. Is that yeah. is my Francis yeah. that I need to find. Right. right. Help him uh, out. Yeah. At yeah. least to get on the phone with her. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I need that shit. I don't think we've. I think there's a lot of mystery still in that, uh, in Bill. And I, I, it's you know. Yes. No. Of course. You know. I know. Are Are you sad we didn't get there? I don't think we can. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. But but it's an interesting discussion to to to, to poke around. Anyway, so what's next for us? All right. That's right. So next for us, we're going to get back to what we normally do, uh, talking about a film from the late 70s or the early 80s. <laughs> we do that? Really? Yeah. Have you noticed we, there's a through line in the uh, years? Yeah, there is. We, we've kind of sk- skated away from it a little bit. Now we're getting back into it. So it's our old well, bread and butter. there have been a lot of divergent things. Or, you know, there like, has. Um, it's been a very strange, uh, crazy Virgin trip. Spring, like, uh, the birds. Virgin Spring, the, bird, the birds yeah. with... Redemic, a big slice of Redemic on the side. Yep. My Indulgence of B.J. Lang, which yeah. is a film that no one should be analyzing for five minutes more than an hour, much less an <laughs> Movies hour. Movies we hate. So, so, yeah. yeah. Now there's a movie that's like, is it even a movie? Because it's a 90-minute television show, yeah. season finale. But we're going to do next week just a goddamn fucking movie like we usually do. The old yeah. days. The old exactly. stuff. The old stuff. What is it? I don't even know what it is. You, you oh, we didn't tell you. No, no, you do. You do know. We we have we have it's talked on the about shortlist. it. We, yeah, we did. Well, we, did. Okay. We, we it was it was in our text chain. Shit. Um, you're gonna be excited. Right. Um, we were gonna and save it for Valentine's Day. Our schedule got a little off uh, out of whack because of um, you know, work and things and travel. But uh, so this is kind of a, a, a in spirit our Valentine's Day episode. But we're also just going to fucking do it because we all love this movie and there's a lot to talk about with it. It's uh, be- it's a Dutch Dutch Valentine's. They do it two weeks later. Right. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I, I just made um, that up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. We're going to be doing uh, from 1980. I think two. I think that's what it is. We're going to be doing. 81, you're right. We're going to be even closer to our niche. Um, 1981's uh, Possession, directed by Andreas Zalowski. Oh. Zalowski, yeah. oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So we're going to be getting big, into possession. Uh, the theatrical version or the American version? Let's get into it. One? Great sub- <laughs> yeah. into it. Great subject. That's, right. That's true. Uh, the yeah. VHS version is very weird and has its own pluses and minuses. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a great topic so, right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Polish uh, Polish filmmaker uh, making a making a film in Germany, starring um, um, Isabella Gianni and Sam Neill. It's one of the most uh, fucked up uh, divorce horror uh, films uh, ever made. And also just has some of the craziest performances and set pieces and yeah. in You're film right. history. This is our second divorce horror movie. Yeah, yeah, you know, it is. We did The Brood. Cronenberg's The Brood was divorce horror. That's you know, right. Like within like uh, two years of, of this one, so... Yeah, so here we wow. go. We're getting we're getting back it. into it. We're gonna get we're we're gonna dive deep into possession and uh, and and yeah, go to town on that flick. And if you haven't seen it, holy shit, get ready. Got to check um, it. <laughs> check out that movie. It's a big deal. Um, and so uh, yeah, I think that's what it's gonna be. All right, everybody. Well, uh, before we let you go, we of course can't let you go. We can't do that to you without your. Is it gonna work? Oh man. Oops. Oh man. Where is it? Hold on. What the hell? Your Just do it, Tom. Yeah. Moment. <laughs> I'm sad. Yeah, I'll do it myself. There Your you go. Moment. <laughs> of Zen. Zen. All right, everybody. Thanks so much and have a good rest of your week. And we will see you next week. All right, everybody. Take care. See you later. Bye. Bye, guys. Hey everybody, Brian here in UPN9. How's it going? I'm doing great. We have something very special for you today. We have Evan Husney and his assistant David. Look at this. We have an escape artist here. Check it out. He's got all this stuff in here. This is all locked up. Oh, it's less than 10, 9, 8. Is he? Oh, he's out of there. Wow. Fantastic. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. That was wicked, man. <laughs>